scripture lesson for today, the selected epistle reading for the Sunday is uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Paul, or someone writing in Paul's name, this is part of the disputed works of Paul. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free. But Christ is all and in all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. One of the early church fathers by the name of Arrhenius, uh, Irenaeus rather, Uh, One of the famous things that he said, I'm going to paraphrase, speaking of God in Christ, he became like us so we could become like him. He took on our human nature so that we could have access and participate in his divine nature. He took on the temporal so that we could participate in the eternal. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, the British Methodist Church, and uh, the American Methodism, which ultimately has become the United Methodist Church at this point, uh, looked back to the beginning of Genesis and uh, was very mindful of historic Christian teaching that God created all of us, humankind, in God's image. But when sin entered into the picture, that image of God was marred, well nigh disappearing, Wesley would say, still there, but you couldn't quite see it anymore because of our human sin. And so when Wesley talked about salvation, he understood salvation in a broad sense. It wasn't just coming to faith in Christ for Wesley. It was much bigger than that. It wasn't just getting our tickets stamped to get on the heaven-bound bus. I give that analogy or that image because my Sunday school class is about to read C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce, and there's a bus that goes to heaven in that. So there's a little commercial for my Sunday school C.S. Lewis We still have a few books remaining. If you'd like to be a part of that study, we start that in earnest next week. But Wesley understood that much larger than just coming to faith in Christ. He would use the terms being justified, justification. But Wesley understood that once we come to faith in Christ, then we have this process through which God makes us holy, brings us to this place of true righteousness. And for for Wesley, that was sanctification. And he also understood that to mean that sin... This stain on our soul would eventually be fully eradicated and dismissed. Now the idea of being without sin is not something we're very uh, used to thinking about or even comfortable talking about perhaps because we can't imagine a day when sin no longer holds sway. But Wesley believed that the grace of God could work in our lives in such a way to bring us to that place. And it was always completely a work of God. It was very clear Wesley would teach and understand that it's not something we do on our own. We do not achieve sanctification. We can never be proud of sanctification as if it's something that we have done. It is always 100% total gift of God. But Wesley did believe 
that we could participate. In fact, we were called to cooperate with God's sanctifying grace to bring us to that place of holiness and righteousness, full salvation, Wesley would understand. And so part of that process then would be getting rid of those things in our life that are antithetical to Christ, getting rid of those things in our life that keep us from following Jesus, those things that are inconsistent with Christ, and taking on those virtues, those attributes of God that bring us to a life of holiness and true righteousness. Our reading for this morning really gives us some images that I think are helpful. It's very clear. Paul says, if you have been raised with Christ, and here's my paraphrase, live like you have been raised with Christ. Set your mind on heavenly things. Live in such a way that Christ is revealed in your life today. Ultimately will be revealed, but live today as if Christ is fully revealed in you, letting go of those things that keep you from looking like Jesus. Sexual impurity. Things like anger and malice and wrath and slander, abusive language coming from your mouth, lying. You just cannot look like Jesus doing those kinds of things. Those kinds of things are damaging to your own soul and they are destructive to community. They are life-draining and community-destroying. And so Paul makes it very clear. Look, if you are numbered with Jesus, if you are raised with Christ, live a resurrected life. Walk away from those things that will pull you down. Walk away from those things that will destroy you and destroy the community. Get rid of those things. Let them die. Don't keep going back to them. I don't know why this memory came to mind for me this week. This memory is over a quarter of a century old. It's one of those memories that I've pretty well put on the back shelf and really don't care to look at it anymore, but for whatever reason, maybe because I was immersed in storytelling this week, I was at the festival gathering of the Network of Biblical Storytellers in Dayton, Ohio, and so we had all of these stories that were being told, and maybe it was just something hearing people tell their stories that made this file fall off the, uh, the folder, fall off the, the file shelf. Maybe it was this text that was ruminating in my head. I was a new pastor. We had just moved to Denton. I was still a bivocational pastor, still had my radio career. I'd started back to school trying to finish my undergraduate work at Pfeiffer College in Meisenheimer, North Carolina. I had four little churches in Denton. Uh, we had a young family. Uh, our son Matthew had just started to school there in Denton. He was four years old when we moved. Casey hadn't come along yet. And I'm not sure if Matthew was in kindergarten or first grade at this point. I'm not really sure the age. I just remember going to pick up Matthew at the soccer field in Denton. Uh, he was finishing soccer practice. And so I was just kind of hanging around and uh, waiting for soccer practice to be over, and I was going to take Matthew home. And one, a woman came up to me, a woman that I didn't know, but who knew that I was a pastor, a new pastor in the community. And she came over to me, a soccer mom, and she came over to me and she wanted to tell me that our son Matthew had terrorized her son at soccer practice. Now, my son wasn't a terrorizing kind of kid, but, and that may not have been the word she used, but that's what it sounded like in my head. Apparently, he had picked on him or something. I don't know what it was, but I remember what I thought in that moment. I was immediately angry. I told her, I assured her I would check into it and certainly have a talk with Matthew if he'd done anything inappropriate. Uh, and I was serious about that. I didn't want Matthew to be engaged in that kind of behavior, and that really did sound out of character for Matthew, just a shy, sweet kid. I couldn't imagine him doing that. So anyway, but where my mind went was complete anger because I felt that my son misbehaving or perceiving to have misbehaved reflected poorly on me, the new pastor in the community. So I became angry. And before I could get Matthew in the car to find out his side of the story, which maybe I really wasn't that interested in hearing, my mind just kept building up this anger and anger. By the time I got him in the car, of course, I, I told him what the lady had said. And I said, now, I want to hear what's going on. Tell me your side of the story. I do not remember what he said. I do not remember his side of the story. My, my guess is that it was probably not, he probably felt about it differently than the mom had felt about it. But 
I was just so angry, and I was so angry because I thought it made me look bad. I thought it reflected poorly on me as a new pastor in the community. You know, you just can't have your kids misbehaving if you're a pastor. The rest of you can get away with all that, but when you're a pastor, it just looks different somehow. It gets magnified, and, and I was new at this pastor game, and so I was, just, I was just dealing with all these kinds of expectations that were probably crazy in my head, but they were in my head, and, and I was angry, and the, and the more I talked, the angrier I got. God, and the louder my voice became, and I'm sure I was doing more talking than listening. I have no doubt that I was doing a lot more talking than listening, and I got so angry as we were driving away that I punched the steering wheel. And I learned something in that moment. If you have an older model car and you're in Denton, North Carolina, and you punch the steering wheel, if you hit the horn just right, it'll get stuck. Denton is a small town, kind of like Highlands. And so I quit yelling because I couldn't out-volume the horn, and, and I was trying my best. I don't, how, do you, how do you unstick a horn? I don't know how you do that. But, but uh, I couldn't get it to quit, and I just... And I pulled up at a stoplight, and there was a lady who pulled up beside me at the stoplight, and I'm trying to nod and smile while the horn just blaring... <laughs> It was really embarrassing and humiliating, and and ultimately, at some point, by the time the horn stopped, I had quit yelling, and me and Matthew were both laughing. (laughs) I learned something in that moment. I, I learned about the absurdity of being angry at the wrong things. I learned about anger, the absurdity of anger that is born out of self interest self-serving motives. Well, you'll be happy to know that's the last steering wheel I've punched. (laughs) Learned my lesson. And I hope I learned my lesson a little bit that day about being a little quicker to listen, slower to speak when I was angry, and maybe just a little less concerned about what the community might think of me if my children did by chance misbehave or were perceived to have misbehaved. I don't know why I thought about that story this week. Maybe it was all the stories I was hearing. Maybe it was this text. I don't don't think, you know, I'm a lot older now, and and the anger thing is is really, I don't think, so much an issue for me. I've kind of mellowed out over the years. I don't really get white hot anger like that anymore. But I got to thinking about this text. I got to thinking about how absurd and and, and silly I was being and wrong I was being in that moment. And I, I began to wonder about those other things maybe in my life that are inconsistent with the witness of Christ. I began to think about those things in my life that I still allow to be a part of my life that keep me from following Jesus as closely as I should. That keep me from living the life that really is life, the fullness of life. This idea of sanctification that Wesley believed in, that we really could get to that point where sin no longer holds sway. Sin no longer dominates our way of thinking. That we can truly live our life in such a way that Christ is fully revealed and completely revealed in us. And so I began to, to think about those kinds of things. And I'm guessing I'm not the only one in the room, perhaps, that still has those life-draining tendencies. It might be on this list. It may be something like anger or malice or wrath or abusive speech or lying. It may be something else. This list is not exhaustive. (laughs) There are plenty of things that keep us from living into the fullness of Christ, that keep us from living a life where Christ is revealed in us. Wesley talked about the means of grace, the Holy Communion, the sacrament of Holy Communion was a means of grace for Wesley. He understood that through these means of grace, God pours out God's Spirit upon us to convict us and bring us to holiness and righteousness. And so maybe this morning, when we gather at this table, maybe there will be a a quiet word of conviction in our own soul. Maybe God will reveal a story in your mind that needs to be remembered, maybe there will be something that rises to the surface that needs to be swept away once and for all. Maybe there are still those behaviors and attitudes, practices that are life-draining, 
and community destroying even in your own heart and life. Well, in this first part of the text, this text that I shared with you, we get this idea of things we ought to quit doing. We get this idea of things we ought to let go. This idea of things that we ought to let die so that we can live fully. If I were to share with you the rest of this third chapter, you would hear Paul talk about those things we should be more open to in our lives. And so as I draw to a close for this message and as we make our way to the holy table this morning, I invite you to hear verses 12 through 17 of the third chapter of Colossians coming immediately after our reading today. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has fault with another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.